Hello and welcome to another episode of the Classical Republican uh, book review. Today we are with Isaac, aka Anarcho Wabbit, and uh, as you can tell from the name, he is uh, an anarchist. And we're going to be reviewing Mutual Aid by <clears throat> by Dean Spade. There it is. Thank you. Um, all right. Since uh, mutual, or yeah, mutual aid. Um, uh, you know, Kropotkin uh, wrote the book on it originally in the 19th century. Um, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about mutual aid and uh, give a synopsis of the book, please, Isaac. Okay. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me on. Um, so this book is a great companion to the original piece of literature by Peter Kropotkin uh, known as Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution. Um, in that book, Kropotkin challenges the prevailing theory of, at the time of social Darwinism and proposes rather that the default state of nature is not competition and conflict, but solidarity and cooperation. He does this through a zoological lens by studying non-human animal behavior, um, but also applies it to things like economics and politics. Um, this book by Dean Spade takes Kropotkin's ideas and applies it to community organizing. It breaks down the differences between mutual aid and charity, and also gives some vital tips to those who may be thinking of starting their own projects. I believe it to be invaluable for anyone, not just those wanting to start community projects, but to those who want to have a greater understanding of how to effectively communicate and organize with others in a group setting. And that's it. That's my brief synopsis of it. All right, thank you. Um, so then I'll go with a um, with sort of a, uh, a classical Republican take on uh, on the book. Um, of course, because uh, Mazzini, you know, I, I I guess as a classical Republican, I do have some claim to mutual aid. Um, of course, uh, Ma uh, Giuseppe Mazzini was. Um, was, uh, was well. There, there, there are some quotes by him where he said, you know, basically says, uh, "Solidarity, not charity." You know, promoting mutual aid over uh, the traditional um, uh, form of charity. Um, so, under a liberal regime, most people do not participate in politics other than voting every few years. But mutual aid gives people participation in the, the form of direct democracy on the local level. And so again, uh, being a classical Republican, um, we, we require a healthy dose of a democratic element. Okay, we don't, we don't want democracy at, uh, you know, everything to be like, uh, you know, Athens, uh, direct democracy at all levels, but, uh, but you do have to have that element um, and it does have to be participatory. Um, let's see, in chapter two, uh, it talks about solidarity, not charity. That's what it's called. Um, and I think this is something that, uh, that Giuseppe Mazzini would really approve of. Uh, Spade talks about uh, nonprofits, uh, how nonprofits demobilize mutual aid and legitimize unjust systems. Uh, change comes through mobilizing masses, uh, not through paid professionals. And so I, I've had a lot of experience with that. Um, well, gosh, since I came, what, 10 years ago to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Twin Falls, Idaho, we, um, you know, we got involved in a lot of uh, volunteer work. Um, you know, I feel like I, you know, with the, the senior center at uh, Salvation Army and, um, uh, you know, the, I, I saw a lot of the, the problems that uh, Spade was talking about um, as far as having a, a hierarchy and stuff like that, and not really having a, a democratic uh, um, a democratic style, uh, you know, mutual aid feel to it. Um, so mutual aid, he said, uh, Spade says, should not feel like uh, volunteering. Uh, you know, should should feel feel good. I get you know a lot of times we say um, there's that saying you know you work um, work at a job you love. You don't work a day in your life, and so that's um, yeah. I think that's what uh, Spade is getting at is that if you're 
doing these things for the uh, for the cause. Um, it doesn't feel like you're, you know, a drudge, you know, any kind of drudgery. Um, it, uh, Spade talks about uh, pet causes, and I wanted to ask you about that. Um, so there's, but so there's, I think there's there's kind of a fine line. Um, well, in some cases, there's kind of a fine line between mutual aid and charity. And um, because, I mean, even if you have like the charity, that's kind of like a big mass movement. Um, I, th I think it can it can kind of fuzzy the line between charity and, uh, and mutual aid. So like there, there was an example. I want to ask, get your opinion on this. Um, there was a, a DSA, you know, the Democratic Socialists of America project in Salt Lake City, uh, where they were helping homeless people. And I just saw this on on their Facebook page, and um, they had, you know, they were they were taking pictures of the homeless people, and <laughs> um, it just seemed like, um, you know, it was the the DSA Salt Lake chapter, uh, you know trying to, to uh, doing a, like a drive to get stuff for, for people, uh, for homeless people. And, you know, it's, you know, it seemed like a good cause. I'm not, um, uh, you know, I'm not saying it was a bad thing, but they, they called it mutual aid. And I'm sure, yeah, maybe there was an element of mutual aid, but I don't know. I just, what, what, what do you think about something like that? Like just trying to get stuff for, homeless people. I mean, it seems more like a charity action than, than mutual aid. Yeah. So I sort of agree. Um, I think the, the whole posting pictures of, of, uh, unhoused people is a little bit of a, um, it's, it feels exploitive to me. Um, it feels like they're exploiting their struggle for, uh, for views or whatever. Um, and I'm not, it, entirely too fond of the the dsa for my own personal reasons but um i think the overall sentiment of trying to help the most vulnerable in your community is a good idea um and i don't know all the details about the specific thing that they did but um it sounds like they had the right intentions but went about it the wrong way from what you're telling me um and you know, get, getting materials and, and things like that for um, for our unhoused neighbors is is definitely a good thing, and I'm I'm not uh, disparaging that um, in any way. But um, I, know, I feel like it, it, the focus should be on uh, them rather than saying, "Oh, we're out here helping them." You know, you're you're putting the focus on yourself rather than that. You know, they need help, and you know, things like that. So I feel like if you're going to do a mutual aid project. Uh, you yeah. shouldn't be, you know, putting people's struggle on blast, essentially. <laughs> yeah. Um, in, in chapter three, uh, they talk about opposition to government. Um, but I was wondering, and especially you being a, uh, an anarchist, um, you talk about the, the dual power structure. Um, I, and I, I see, I see dual, I, I think we have that in common somewhat because, you know, we believe in, in the, uh, mixed regime as classical Republicans, uh, we believe in the mixed regime. And so you have to have these, uh, these, um, you know, opposing institutions who can kind of stand on their own and oppose domination by one, one group. Um, but, um, yeah, and I and I totally get the the idea of being co-opted by government. Like that's not a good thing. Um, you want to maintain your independence so that you can um, act independently when the the government is uh, is failing. You know, they or or just in opposition to the cause. Um, but I was wondering if um, you know if if you're trying to go for a mass movement um and you're 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 not um you're not um you know, is is it is it sometimes better to kind of uh you know market yourself as um not in opposition to the government but um 
kind of an not necessarily an alternative, but uh, you know, going back to the dual power structure, you know, if the government isn't going to do something about it, well, there's this other option, and that's the you know, it's the mutual aid group. Um, yeah, so I mean, um, so D um, Dean Spade says that you can't, um, you know, you have to be in opposition to government, and 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 to to be able to change things. But I, I was wondering, could you not, and maybe you're gonna call me a, a reactionary or ultra conservative, but but couldn't you appeal to somebody, to to the public, especially in you know conservative Southern Idaho, couldn't you appeal to the masses uh, from a conservative perspective saying, hey, our, our help or our cause is going to help maintain uh the status quo rather than tearing down the status quo because people are so tied to the status quo even if they don't really understand what the what that means um sometimes calling for change just is too scary for people so if if you say hey we're going to you know by us helping where the government will not help our um you know we're going to help maintain uh, or improve people's standard of living, um, uh, you know, and people's independence in their, um, in, in a non-domination uh, type of situation. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, would it, would it be okay to make that, uh, to, to make that argument that you are supporting a, a the status quo uh, whereas the government is 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 negligent or um, or uh, you know causing some change that uh, is just uh, unacceptable to the masses. Yeah, well, um, in certain circumstances, I think that uh, shifting your messaging a little bit to reach as many people as possible um, is a viable strategy. I am skeptical of saying that uh, an anarchist or mutual aid movement is helping to preserve the status quo um, because the status quo is basically everything mutual aid is against in my opinion. Um, I think that rather than um, shifting messaging uh, we should educate on why the status quo is failing and why mutual aid and, and things like anarchism are the answer to the failing of the status quo in the state. Um, so uh, I have in, in my personal life, uh, when I talk to people who are more conservative and I guess uh, people who do themselves as uh, small government, you know, depending on the person, um, I, I also say, hey, I'm for small government too, in fact, I'm for small government, so small that there is no government. And then they, you know, they get a little confused by that. So I, you know, I kind of explain my, uh, my positions and things like that and answer questions. And sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't go well. Um, I've personally uh, moved people that are, I would say are borderline fascists. Like I have a friend who, who used to be a monarchist, which is, you know, wild but um he's now an anarchist and um some family members of mine used to be pretty uh pretty conservative and now they're starting to move over to anarchism and libertarianism i guess um so it, it's it's baby steps um they, we can't expect to shift everyone's understanding immediately and you know in one fell swoop but um i definitely think that uh you know educating people rather than shifting our messaging is is the better strategy um let's see in chapter four i really liked um how they how uh, dean spade calls for a, a, a need for a parliamentary procedure um you know having an agenda keeping minutes vote voting um and um oh, and then also like having the the consensus so sometimes, you know, it's not going to be, uh, it, I, yeah, I guess, I, I, don't, I don't know if it comes out. I mean, it's clear to me. I don't know if it, it's clear to everybody because I've been involved in organizations that, um, 
that have sort of a, well, some that have consensus and some who have, you know, they have hard parliamentary procedure and a vote that makes the, you know, that the majority makes the decision. Um, I, I've, I've been, I, I tend to side more with parliamentary procedure. I have, um, and, and this is probably kind of, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it is surprising to most people that in education, when you have a committee, um, they don't really do, they don't really do it by the book. They don't do it by parliamentary procedure. They try to just build consensus and um, even the, the chair will be, uh, you know, chosen by somebody else is not elected. And, and so that's, it's really not very democratic. You have the, the chair just, you know, saying like, uh, so this is what we're going to do. And everyone can just kind of, uh, you know, give their two cents. Uh, there's not going to be a vote <laughs> and, uh, the chair just kind of, you know, goes on as if there is democratic legitimacy to the process, but there's not. Um, what was your reading in, uh, what was your understanding on chapter four about how, um, how organized um, the, the group needs to be? Um, well, I, I do, I written about uh, consensus democracy. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna dip into my analysis a little bit and just read from this. Um, so I think the, uh, the best parts of the book, um, when, or how it talks about, you know, how to create and run uh, a mutual aid organization, um, all the stuff about solidarity, not charity is great, but I feel like there's a little bit too much of it. Um, if there's one complaint I have about this book, it's that it spends too much time differentiating mutual aid from charity, even though it is, a, a, an important distinction. I just think it spends too much time on that idea rather than well, what the actual focus of the book should be. Um, but anyway, I digress. Um, consensus democracy, um, for anyone who doesn't know already, um, it, uh, is basically decision-making that ensures everyone involved is happy with the end result, um, or at least is okay with it. Um, it ensures everyone's voice is heard and that no one is able to take charge of the group by force. Um, personally, I think this is the best way to organize a group. Um, as opposed to direct democracy, it's not a simple yes or no vote that can make it to where 49% of your group's voice is shut out because they lose a vote by one. Um, a lot of the times anarchists advocate for direct democracy and things like that. Um, and there's kind of a split within uh, anarchists and anarchism, uh, whether you want direct democracy or consensus or anything like that, um, because direct democracy sometimes is a tyranny of the majority you know, things like that. Um, so I definitely do think consensus democracy ensures that all options are considered and that the final decision is agreed upon by everyone within the group. Um, and I think that that's the best way to organize a group. And I, I believe that should definitely be um, how it's done. So yeah, that's my two cents. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Um, consensus would be great, but um, I don't know, maybe I've just been, um, Burn too many times, uh, you know, being a part of groups where, um, where, you know, one, one person spoke against the idea, two people spoke for it, but there's like eight people in the group. So we don't really know what the, what the, what the, what everybody um, really felt. And so but you have the charismatic leader who's just saying, well, we're gonna do this. And everybody just kind of like, eh, whatever. <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I think consensus would be best, um, you know, maybe super majorities or whatnot, uh, maybe would, would help promote that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think, uh, you're right. Like uh, Dean Spade spends a lot of time um, on certain things when we we really need to get to the the meat and bones of of, of mutual aid. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, it's pretty good. Um, do you have anything else? Any other comments on the the book? 
Yeah, so um, I do just I do want to uh, talk a little bit about um, how it it goes into a lot of historical examples of mutual aid projects, um, namely the Black Panther Free Breakfast Program and similar projects by the Young Lords. Um, it also mentions various movements throughout the 60s and 70s, including abortion clinics, health clinics specifically for LGBTQ people, and tenants unions. Um, mutual aid, or at least something very similar to it, was also practiced in many indigenous tribes before American colonization. Um, and it's often practiced uh, during natural disasters with organizers helping with supplies and rescue missions. Um, and just while we're on this topic, I'd like to plug one of my favorite books about this specific subject. Um, it's called Black Flags and Windmills by Scott Crow. Um, it's all about the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and how the absence of government assistance, um, mutual aid organizations popped up to help the people affected by the hurricane by setting up things like health clinics and neighborhood assemblies. Um, they even helped defend marginalized communities from white supremacist militias and police brutality. Um, I just thought I would throw that little suggestion in there if anyone is interested in checking that out. Um, but uh, I feel like in, in this day and age, it seems like a lot of people are in need of help more than ever. Um, we're seeing a huge wave of anti-LGBTQ laws being proposed and passed. Um, the overturning of Roe v. Wade is a huge step back in the struggle for bodily autonomy. And it seems like white supremacists and fascist groups are becoming more and more emboldened by the day. Um, but I'm here to tell you that you don't have to sit back and watch it happen. Um, you can get out there in your community and help fight back against every single one of these things. Um, and some of my favorite stories from the last year are from actions done by various chapters of the John Brown Gun Club, um, a leftist aligned group that is not afraid to flaunt their guns in defense of their community. Um, in response to fascist groups trying to, to disrupt uh, drag queen story hours around the country, uh, members of this organization stood guard outside and protected the attendance from fascist violence. And more recently, uh, police tried to sweep a homeless encampment in Dallas, Texas, but members of the John Brown Gun Club showed up armed and got the police to go away. Um, but I'm not saying you have to show up armed and stare down cops and fascists. Um, if you're able to, I think the best way to start some sort of mutual aid project is to start a community fridge. Um, that is probably one of the easiest mutual aid projects to do. Um, of course, it's a bit of an investment with probably no return, um, but you'll be helping the most vulnerable people in your community, and that's all that really matters. Um, if you want to learn more about these things, I recommend checking out a YouTube channel known as Reeducation on YouTube. Um, that channel has some good videos about how to organize your community um, and start a community bridge. It also adds a tons of great content to learn about anarchism, if that's something you're interested in at all. Um, but anyway, yeah, so I do think this book is, uh, is really good. Um, I recommend it for anyone, um, not just if you want to start a mutual aid group or an organizing project, but if you just want to learn how to communicate with people in groups better, this is a great book for you. Um, or even if you're, you're just interested in, in learning about uh, alternatives to, to government assistance. But um, yeah, so that's basically all I got for this. So yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. That's all I got too. So um, you have a good day. You too. Thank you.